World population, let's start with some basics, shall we? How many people are alive on the planet right now? Where are these people at? How did it get to be that way? Ah, those are complicated questions. Let's start with the easy one first. There's seven billion people alive on the planet right now. Give or take a hundred million here or there. That's seven billion with a B. That's a seven with a hell load of zeros after it. Now, has that always been the case? One might make the logical assumption that this number of seven billion has been achieved over a slow, steady progression over human history of hundreds of thousands of years of predictable, calculated, steady growth rate that's reached the zenith of seven billion right now. And one would be completely wrong in that assumption. We are living through an anomaly of human history, quite frankly, in that population is exceptionally exponentially growing right this second. And this is a product really of just the last 200 years. And we really can't understand today's world demographics, much less predict the future world demographics without understanding the past. So let's take a trip back and look at how this human history and these human population totals have evolved over time, shall we? Now, if we'd gone back at any given point in the last half million years of human evolution and human societal evolution, that is evolution of the society of humans, uh, we would see that the greater portion of this, uh, humans were what we call hunter-gatherers, hanging out in small groups, picking berries and fruits, running away from dinosaurs or whatever, in very small numbers, in very small bands or tribes. And given that, the population total of the planet was very small. 10 million, 20 million people for the great portion of the last half million years. That starts to shift significantly though uh, during the agricultural revolution. And this is about 10,000 years ago. And that's when humans changed the way they live and their population total subsequently. The agricultural revolution about eight to 10,000 years ago is when people started growing food. Duh, they became farmers. They settled down from the hunter-gatherer nomadic lifestyle and started growing food. So what? How would that affect things? They could grow more food in a more stable situation, which meant they had surpluses year after year, more food so they could have more babies and feed those babies and those babies stay alive. So there's more people then to have more people, more people, more people. Ah, that's when population starts its steady, slow growth over time. This gets accelerated by something we call civilization, which kind of popped up at the same time. People organizing into societies around those farming communities, and there's job specialization, and small villages form, which then form small towns, and then big cities, and empires, and all the rest. We'll get to that in a little bit. However, that also accentuates this idea of the population will start to grow as more people can stay alive, and there's more food and more everything to keep people alive. So population starts to grow at a slow but steady pace. And that was the case for the last eight to 10,000 years. But even given all that, we're still looking at population totals that are very small. 100 million people, 200 million people, 300 million people for the entire globe. See what I'm getting at here? This now radically changes when we hit a critical number of the first 1 billion people that were alive about 200 years ago. And this is when society undergoes yet another revolutionary change in something we call the industrial revolution. That's right, where machines are making machines and machines can grow more food. One big tractor can make even more food than a hundred or a thousand people could. So there's more agricultural surplus and more stuff and more mechanization and you can keep more people alive. So this is when population really takes off and starts running fast. And let's look at, very quickly at some numbers now of just the last couple hundred years so you can understand at what the importance of what I'm talking about happening right this second. One billion people alive, the hallmark was reached in 1804, roughly 200 years ago. It only takes another 123 years to get to two billion people alive by 1927. Now again, quickly do the math here. It's taken all of human history to build up to a population total of one billion by 1804, and just 123 years later now, due to industrialization and civilization and agriculture and everything else, we've added another billion in just 123 years. But this is an exponential growth thing. It ain't mathematical. It's not two plus two plus two. You're adding several people to the population every year. It's two times two, times four, times eight, as more people are added to the population, which are creating more people. Exponential growth. 
By 1960, just 33 years later, you have the third billion people alive at the same time. And now we can go fairly quickly through this. Four billion people by 1974. That's only 14 years later that they've added another billion. 13 years after that, we reach five billion people in 1987. And indeed, we reached six billion people right at the turn of the millennium in 1999. Six billion people alive. And you can kind of now look at the math here. 14 years later, 13 years later, 12 years later, you're adding another billion. And indeed, here in 2010, about 11 years later, we've reached the 7 billion mark. You can kind of do a rough gauge, rough estimate now and say about every decade, you're adding on another billion people. So we can start to now predict in the future and say, ah, by 2020, certainly we're going to have 8 billion, if not a little sooner, if not by 2017 or 2018. See how this exponential growth makes these numbers much bigger, much faster, and how this has not been the norm for most of human history. Okay, so there's 7 billion people alive on planet Earth right now. So what? Uh, where the hell they are is of much more consequence, especially if you want to understand our globalizing world and issues and problems and things that are happening all over the place. Where are these 7 billion people at? To answer this question, we'll first look at a population density map. Now, this is not a population total map. This is population density. It's not giving you a total number. It's telling you where people are packed into or where people are uh, not at home at all. And on this map, take a look at it. Uh, the darker the area, the more people are packed in per square mile or square kilometer. And the dark reds, over 200, 300, 400 people per square mile. And indeed, in some major cities, it's way more than that, like 1,000 or 2,000 people packed in per square mile. Uh, the inverse is the pale yellow tan color, which is one or two or three people per square mile. That's it. Individuals, two or three of them per square mile. Nobody home. Can you detect any geographic pattern by looking at this? Any spatial pattern? Uh, use your powers of perception and maybe hit pause and take a look at this and see if you can figure out why are people in certain places? What's the pattern and maybe why is that? Hit pause and figure that out now. Okay, welcome back from the pause. Now let's do it together. Where are people at and why are they clustered there? Perhaps it's best answered by looking at the inverse first, which is where are people not? And that can be answered very easily uh, by examining the physical environment of planet Earth. Now, you learn this in third grade science, I hope. Uh, the world is 70% water, <laughs> ocean and only 30% land. Now, we ain't Kevin Costner's water world yet, so we can rule out 70% of the Earth where the oceans are. Nobody's living there. Not yet. Uh, the other 30% that is land, though, it is not equally distributed where the peoples are. In fact, you've already detected they're concentrated in only sections of that 30% of the Earth's surface that's land. How can we detect where people are not at by the physical world? Let's start with climate. Uh, people don't like being cold. <laughs> Unless you're Santa Claus, uh, people don't live in polar regions. Hardly anybody lives up way up north or way down south. Uh, northern Canada, northern Russia, Iceland, Greenland, northern Scandinavia, much less the North Pole, or even Antarctica. Nobody lives down there. It's just too cold. It's too extreme. We don't dig it. You can't grow enough food. It's not fun. However, one might then logically conclude that everybody really likes hot tropical areas. And indeed, in the equatorial regions, the tropical zones of planet Earth down near the equator, yeah, there's a pretty significant population. Uh, Indonesia is a very populated country. But by and large, if you look across the entire equatorial zone, there are not heavy concentrations of population outside of, say, Indonesia, certain parts of Indonesia. Yes, there's a lot of people in tropical Africa. Yes, there's some people in tropical uh, South America, but not heavy population clusters that you see in other parts of the world. What else would account for where people are not at? Uh, how about mountains? Uh, people don't like living on the tops of mountains. Yeah, we go there to ski and party and climb, but then you go home. Uh, mountains are not conducive for uh, humans to live in either. Uh, they're too tall. Uh, uh, it's too harsh of climate. Uh, they're steep. Uh, you can't grow food there uh, quite a lot. So the mountainous areas of interior Asia, the Tibetan Plateau, which sits at 12,000 feet above sea level. I mean, it's a tough, forbidding environment. But also highland areas in parts of Africa, uh, the Alps in Europe, 
to look over at the Rocky Mountain system in North America and the Andes of South America, you can easily detect that people are not living in those mountainous regions. Finally, and perhaps most easily identified, is deserts. That's right, humans need water to stay alive, so people don't live in deserts. They don't even live near deserts. So if you look at the map of the significant desert areas of planet Earth, you'll see there's nobody home there either. And of course, the Sahara Desert, the biggest hot desert on planet Earth, encompasses all of North Africa. Nobody home there, population-wise. All of interior Australia is a desert. Nobody there either. Big parts of Central Asia, the entire Arabian Peninsula. Nobody home, it's sand, dudes. But also the western fringes of North America, the Sonoran, Chihuahua, and Mojave Desert, uh, and also big deserts in western South America as well, the Atacama, one of the driest places on Earth. And you can see this translated, there are not lots of people living in those areas. We need water, we ain't living in deserts. Broad generalizations just based on the physical world to understand population density. Uh, most people live in mid-latitude climates. That's the in-between. Not the poles, not the cold polar areas, not the hot tropics, the in-between. That's the mid-latitudes, more temperate climate. It doesn't get quite so hot in the summer, it doesn't get quite so cold in the winter. Yes, there are extremes of temperature, but it's pretty temperate, it's pretty chill. And you'll see that most humans live in this mid-latitude temperate climate zone from the uh, United States and Southern Canada, all the way through Europe, all the way through China. Mid-latitude climates. Most people also live in coastal regions. Almost all humans are within five or 600 miles of an ocean shore. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is mostly coastal margins are a little flatter, not always, uh, but you can grow food in flatland areas. So even if you're not in a coastal area, flatland areas are heavily densely populated. And even if you're not near an ocean, not in a flatland, not in a mid-latitude climate, most people live near water because humans need water to live. So even in the arid parts of the planet where there are people, they are concentrated heavily where water sources are. Major rivers, major inland bodies of water. One need look no further than Egypt, zoom into that to see that it's a heavily populated state. All of the people are densely packed on the Nile River Basin. You gotta have water to live. Now, having said that, let's back it back up to the globe. Where are the four biggest population density clusters? Okay, again, we're talking about density. Where are people packed into? Not population totals, not yet, all right? And panning from right to left on this map, we can make some broad generalizations which hold true. And that is, we start in Eastern Eurasia, East Asia in particular, Eastern China, the Koreas, Japan, even down to Southeast Asia. People are stacked on top of people in this place. Uh, over a billion and a half, maybe two billion people in this region of planet Earth just packed in here, high density, high concentrations. We kind of scoot over to India, the entire South Asian region, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. All of these are top 10 most populous countries, and they have another billion and a half people packed in high densities there. Now let's pan up to Europe. And for this, we'll take Western and Eastern Europe together, and even include the Western fringe of Russia. It's just one continuous, highly populated, dense zone of urbanization from Western Russia all the way through through Spain, the, the UK. Europe is packed. And for the last one, we'll jump across the Atlantic to the United States. If you find the Mississippi River Basin there, you'll see from the Mississippi all the way to the Eastern Seaboard is one continuous, highly densely packed area of people as well. Particularly up in that Northeastern old industrial sector of the United States around the Great Lakes to uh, uh, from Chicago over to New York down to DC, highly populated, highly densely populated area of planet Earth. Now. Why so many people in those specific areas? Again, we pointed out the physical world where people are not. And yes, all of those four big, densely populated areas have nice physical environments. Mid-latitudes, access to water, they can grow food. That's nice, but there's more going on than just the physical world. Some of the answers to why these are the heavily populated areas lies in cultural historical reasons as well. What do I mean by cultural historical? Uh, in a word, civilization and some other innovations that humans have come up with have helped make those particular places very 
densely populated. We'll start with the civilization itself. Civilization makes for booming populations. It has over time that we've seen the advent of the agricultural revolution and then civilization which followed allowed for job specialization and then you have people that become tinsmiths and herdsmen and doctors and lawyers. Too bad about the lawyers. But people who add stuff to the society gets more complex and they have agricultural surpluses in these civilizations which then allows more people to have more food, to have more babies, and then they have increasing uh, technologies in healthcare and shelter and sanitation and all these things keep people alive. And over time, you have bigger and bigger populations. I say this in particular when we think about China and India. Did you ever wonder for one second, why do they have a billion people in China? Why is there another billion people in India? I mean, are these people just having mad hot sex all the time and they're just kicking out the babies like there's no tomorrow? Well, maybe, actually not really. It has a lot more to do with their long continuous history of stable civilization. Now, how so? Well, it's not just the civilization, it's areas that are in conducive physical environments, that is areas access to water can grow lots of food, in conjunction with a long, stable, continuous civilization history, which adds all these benefits to society and allows for the population to grow bigger and bigger and bigger every year. More and more people getting busier and busier, having more and more kids who in turn have more and more kids. It's very much like a compounding interest on an investment in the stock market. It may start small. China and India started with small populations several thousand years ago. And over time, as you invest in the stock market and your compound interest, you start small and you get a little bit of interest in year one and that adds into the base and it gets bigger. And in year two, you get a little bit of interest and it adds in. And that happens over every year that passes. If you leave your money in that compounding interest investment long enough, you'll end up a millionaire in 50 years because it reaches a critical point that it's gotten this big and now you're making a lot of interest every year and it's getting bigger and you make more interest and it's gotten bigger. Same holds true with populations. In continuous long civilizations like China and India that have been around for several thousand years, things started small and they've added more people and more people and more people making more people and more people and now you got a billion people in each one of these countries. Does that make a little bit of sense? But hey, wait a minute. I thought you said civilization makes for higher populations. What about the Aztecs? What about Mesopotamia? What about Egypt? That's right, Egypt was an ancient civilization. I saw the mummy one and two. Yes, that's all true. There's lots of other ancient civilizations too, but keep in mind what I said. Conducive physical environments, both Egypt and Mesopotamia, they're actually in arid areas. They can't really sustain huge populations. They're desert, all right? And on top of that, none of the other ancient civilizations were continuous. All of them came and went, all right? Crashed and burned, Mesopotamia went away, Egypt went away for a long time, the Aztecs were crushed. So only in China and India, and maybe some in Southeast Asia, do you have very long, very continuous, stable civilizations which have built up populations in conducive phys physical environments over a long period of time. And that's quite important to understanding today's world. But wait a minute, I'm confused more because we also pointed out Europe is a heavily densely populated area as well as the United States. And they ain't ancient. Neither one of those are ancient civilizations. What gives? Well, the Europeans were the first back in 1804. Remember that day where the first billion people showed up on planet Earth? The Europeans had the industrial revolution. And they also had a scientific revolution. And basically what these revolutions did was uh, the industrial revolution make machines which make more machines and increase productivity. And now you can make a tractor uh, that can now plow 10 million acres as opposed to 10 million people plowing those acres. So as technology increases in the industrial revolution, you make more food, more surplus, more everything, more babies. And then the scientific revolution on top of that uh, increases technology, particularly medical technology, increases in sanitation and understanding diseases and vaccinations and all of these things together keep more and more people alive. So more food going into the system, bigger populations, they stay alive longer because of science and industrialization and all that. And those two in combination caught these two places up. So Western Europe explodes in population in the last three or 400 years and the Northeastern quadrant of America follows suit with their own industrial revolution and scientific revolution as well. Does that make sense why those particular areas are extremely densely populated on planet Earth? But wait,
wait a minute. I'm confused. Isn't every place on planet Earth part of civilization now? I mean, we wouldn't say that there's some uncivilized country somewhere that's disconnected and there's still a bunch of hunter-gatherers. That doesn't exist. Uh, in our globalized world, every place on the planet has access uh, to technology, to agricultural surpluses, or at least the technology to make agricultural surpluses, and medicine, and there's international aid, and, and money floats around. So, And every place on planet Earth is urbanizing, and people are moving to cities, and how can we say that, you know, that there's no place that's not on this civilization scheme and civilization increases population? You're right, and it does! Absolutely correct! It's one of the reasons why populations are growing all over the planet, because all places now have access to all of these things, to industrialization and medicine and lots of stuff. But, but, the physical world is not the same in all of the regions of the world. The historical background is not the same. The historical lineage, how long they've been around, is not the same. Cultural attitudes and cultural norms towards family size are not the same everywhere, which means that population growth rates, therefore, are not the same all across the planet from region to region. And thus, world population totals in today's world are not equally distributed across the planet either. That seven billion is not nicely spread out amongst the regions. In fact, I want you to know these numbers for the regions starting right now. Let's go from biggest to smallest. Let's pop up our world regional map. And the biggest population total, now we're talking total, not density. The biggest population total on planet Earth, of course, goes to East Asia. Uh, East, uh, Eastern China and the Koreas and Taiwan one and a half billion, that's billion with a B, people packed into this area. In close pursuit is South Asia with 1.4 billion folks. Sub-Sahara Africa comes in at 700 million, million with an M now, uh, followed by Southeast Asia at 600 million. Let's pause the boat for just one moment to contemplate this. Just between East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia from China, wrapping around to India, you have virtually one half of the Earth's population. There it is, just in three regions. Let's follow on with the Middle East at 550 million folks. And South America has 500 million, that's half a billion, followed by Western Europe with 400 million people. And North America, that's the US and Canada, comes in at 340. Now again, we just pointed those two out. High population densities in parts of the U.S. and in Western Europe, but they don't have the largest population totals. If we added in Eastern Europe at 200 million people, then you have 600 million in Europe in total, and that's getting to be a pretty hefty number. Let's go to the biggest country on planet Earth. Russia has a mere 145 million citizens. That don't seem like much for the biggest country. Hey, dig this. Japan, right next door, has 127 million people. That's right. Tiny Japan has about as many people as ginormous Russia. Let's go to Mexico now with 115 million citizens. Central Asia at 100 million citizens. Turkey at 70 million people. Central American states have 45 million. And 40 million in the Caribbean. Have we pretty much wrapped it up? Is that it? Oh, that's right. We can't forget Australia that has a whopping 23 million folks. And, of course, a heck of a lot of dingoes running around. Do contemplate that for a second, too. 23 million people in all of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, most major cities have way more than 23 million people. The beltway around D.C. has more people than Australia's got. So, food for thought about where people are, where resources are, where stuff's moving around, where people are moving around to. Is this a stagnant snapshot of these 7 billion folks? I mean, is that it? We're done? There's the numbers. Here you go. Learn them. We're done. Not hardly. Not by a long shot. I already said that population growth rates are not equally distributed around the globe. They're not the same everywhere. They haven't been historically. They're not today. Some regions are growing extremely fast, while others are actually shrinking in size. What? Is that possible? Yeah, I know. Some places are actually getting smaller every year. Uh, and I want you to understand the dynamics of how this is occurring so you can understand today, but also predict the future. And you can start understanding this by doing a little research in your own family tree. Do this around the next Thanksgiving Day dinner table. 
Uh, find out how many brothers and sisters your great-grandparents had. Any of your great-grandparents, or all of them. How many siblings did great-grandma have? Then ask grandma and grandpa. Hey, grandpa, how many brothers and sisters did you have? Then ask your mom and dad, how many brothers and sisters did you guys have? And you probably don't even need to ask them. You probably know your aunts and uncles by name. And then look at yourself. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I'm going to go out on a limb here. Have the numbers gotten smaller over the course of just the generation in your own family? I'll bet they have. And in fact, if they have not gotten smaller, I'm willing to hypothesize this. You're not from the United States, are you? Uh, or if you are from the United States, you probably belong to a religious group that prizes larger families or has some sort of policy about family size. That's right. If your family size has gotten bigger over the course of the generations of your single family, then you're probably either Catholic or Mormon or from Zimbabwe. Am I right or am I right? That's what I thought I'm right. Now, that's just within your own family tree. Now we've got to bring this logic that some things are changing over time in certain states, yours included, here in America. How are things changing in other parts of the world? Is family size growing smaller in Africa? Probably not. Uh, is it getting bigger in China? You think probably, and you'd be wrong. What is going on? And, and more importantly, where will the next billion people be living? That's right, we said there's going to be 8 billion people by 2020, so we're going to add a billion more. Where are they going to be at? The U.S., Switzerland, China? Are they going to be living in a big metropolitan area or are they going to be living on a farm out in the sticks? What will the average family size be? Will the average family size in America be the same as the average family size in Zimbabwe? Probably not. How can we get the answers to how these things are going to play out? And of course, you can ask yourself, how many kids do you want to have? All these questions could be answered in this tidy little model, which describes how societies evolve over time and how that impacts family size and thus population growth rates and thus the population totals of particular states and regions. And we'll get to that next. It's called the demographic transition.